The Alchemist Paulo Coelho Translated by Alan R. Clark Published 1992 ISBN 0-72-25-3293-8 The first day passed. There was a major battle nearby, and a number of wounded were brought back to the camp. The dead soldiers were replaced by others, and life went on. Death doesn't change anything, the boy thought. You could have died later on, a soldier said to the body of one of his companions. You could have died after peace had been declared. But, in any case, you were going to die. At the end of the day, the boy went looking for the alchemist, who had taken his falcon out into the desert. I still have no idea how to turn myself into the wind, the boy repeated. Remember what I told you, the world is only the visible aspect of God. And that what alchemy does is to bring spiritual perfection into contact with the material plane. What are you doing? Feeding my falcon. If I'm not able to turn myself into the wind, we're going to die, the boy said. Why feed your falcon? You're the one who may die, the alchemist said. I already know how to. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 80-94 Turn myself into the wind. Asterisk On the second day, the boy climbed to the top of a cliff near the camp. The sentinels allowed him to go. They had already heard about the sorcerer, who could turn himself into the wind, and they didn't want to go near him. In any case, the desert was impassable. He spent the entire afternoon of the second day looking out over the desert, and listening to his heart. The boy knew the desert sensed his fear. They both spoke the same language. Asterisk. On the third day, the chief met with his officers. He called the alchemist to the meeting and said, Let's go see the boy who turns himself into the wind. Let's, the alchemist answered. The boy took them to the cliff where he had been on the previous day. He told them all to be seated. It's going to take a while, the boy said. We're in no hurry, the chief answered. We are men of the desert. The boy looked out at the horizon. There were mountains in the distance. And there were dunes, rocks, and plants that insisted on living where survival seemed impossible. There was the desert that he had wandered for so many months, despite all that time, he knew only a small part of it. Within that small part, he had found an Englishman, caravans, tribal wars, and an oasis with 50,000 palm trees and 300 wells. What do you want here today? The desert asked him. Didn't you spend enough time looking at me yesterday? Somewhere you are holding the person I love, the boy said. So when I look out over your sands, I am also looking at her. I want to return to her, and I need your help so that I can turn myself into the wind. What is love? The desert asked. Love is the falcon's flight over your sands. Because for him, you are a green field, from which he always returns with game. He knows your rocks, your dunes, and your mountains, and you are generous to him. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 81-94 The falcon's beak carries bits of me, myself, the desert said. For years, I care for his game, feeding it with the little water that I have, and then I show him where the game is. And, one day, as I enjoy the fact that his game thrives on my surface, the falcon dives out of the sky, and takes away what I've created. But that's why you created the game in the first place, the boy answered. To nourish the falcon. And the falcon then nourishes man. And, eventually, man will nourish your sands, where the game will once again flourish. That's how the world goes. So is that what love is? Yes, that's what love is. It's what makes the game become the falcon, the falcon become man, and man, in his turn, the desert. It's what turns lead into gold, and makes the gold return to the earth. I don't understand what you're talking about, the desert said. But you can at least understand that somewhere in your sands there is a woman waiting for me. And that's why I have to turn myself into the wind. The desert didn't answer him for a few moments. Then it told him, I'll give you my sands to help the wind to blow, but, alone, I can't do anything. You have to ask for help from the wind. A breeze began to blow. The tribesmen watched the boy from a distance, talking among themselves in a language that the boy couldn't understand. The alchemist smiled. The wind approached the boy and touched his face. It knew of the boy's talk with the desert, because the winds know everything. They blow across the world without a birthplace, and with no place to die. Help me, the boy said. One day you carried the voice of my loved one to me. Who taught you to speak the language of the desert and the wind? My heart, the boy answered. 
The wind has many names. In that part of the world, it was called the Sirocco, because it brought moisture from the oceans to the east. In the distant land the boy came from, they called it the Levanter, because they believed that it brought with it the sands of the desert, and the screams of the Moorish wars. Perhaps in the places beyond the pastures were his. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 82-94 Sheep lived, men thought that the wind came from Andalusia. But, actually, the wind came from no place at all, nor did it go to any place, that's why it was stronger than the desert. Someone might one day plant trees in the desert, and even raise sheep there, but never would they harness the wind. You can't be the wind, the wind said. We're two very different things. That's not true, the boy said. I learned the alchemist's secrets in my travels. I have inside me the winds, the deserts, the oceans, the stars, and everything created in the universe. We were all made by the same hand, and we have the same soul. I want to be like you, able to reach every corner of the world, cross the seas, blow away the sands that cover my treasure, and carry the voice of the woman I love. I heard what you were talking about the other day with the alchemist, the wind said. He said that everything has its own destiny. But people can't turn themselves into the wind. Just teach me to be the wind for a few moments, the boy said. So you and I can talk about the limitless possibilities of people and the winds. The wind's curiosity was aroused, something that had never happened before. It wanted to talk about those things, but it didn't know how to turn a man into the wind. And look how many things the wind already knew how to do. It created deserts, sank ships, felled entire forests, and blew through cities filled with music and strange noises. It felt that it had no limits, yet here was a boy saying that there were other things the wind should be able to do. This is what we call love, the boy said, seeing that the wind was close to granting what he requested. When you are loved, you can do anything in creation. When you are loved, there's no need at all to understand what's happening, because everything happens within you, and even men can turn themselves into the wind. As long as the wind helps, of course. The wind was a proud being, and it was becoming irritated with what the boy was saying. It commenced to blow harder, raising the desert sands. But finally it had to recognize that, even making its way around the world, it didn't know how to turn a man into the wind. And it knew nothing about love. In my travels around the world, I've often seen people speaking of love and looking toward the heavens, the wind said, furious at having to acknowledge its own limitations. Maybe it's better to ask heaven. Well then, help me do that, the boy said. Fill this place with a sandstorm so strong that it blots out the sun. Then I can look to heaven without. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 83-94 Blinding Myself So the wind blew with all its strength, and the sky was filled with sand. The sun was turned into a golden disk. At the camp, it was difficult to see anything. The men of the desert were already familiar with that wind. They called it the Simum, and it was worse than a storm at sea. Their horses cried out, and all their weapons were filled with sand. On the heights, one of the commanders turned to the chief and said, Maybe we had better end this. They could barely see the boy. Their faces were covered with the blue cloths, and their eyes showed fear. Let's stop this, another commander said. I want to see the greatness of Allah, the chief said, with respect. I want to see how a man turns himself into the wind. But he made a mental note of the names of the two men who had expressed their fear. As soon as the wind stopped, he was going to remove them from their commands, because true men of the desert are not afraid. The wind told me that you know about love the boy said to the sun. If you know about love, you must also know about the soul of the world, because it's made of love. From where I am, the sun said, I can see the soul of the world. It communicates with my soul, and together we cause the plants to grow, and the sheep to seek out shade. From where I am, and I'm a long way from the earth, I learned how to love. I know that if I came even a little bit closer to the earth, everything there would die, and the soul of the world would no longer exist. So we contemplate each other, and we want each other, and I give it life and warmth, and it gives me my reason for living. So you know about love, the boy said. And I know the soul of the world, because we have talked at great length to each other during this endless trip through the universe. It tells me that its greatest problem is that, up until now, only the minerals and vegetables understand that all things are one. That there's no need for iron to be the same as copper, or copper the same as gold. Each performs its own exact function as a unique being, and everything would be a symphony of peace if the hand that wrote all this had stopped on the fifth day of creation. 
But there was a sixth day, the sun went on. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 84-94 You are wise, because you observe everything from a distance, the boy said. But you don't know about love. If there hadn't been a sixth day, man would not exist, copper would always be just copper, and lead just lead. It's true that everything has its destiny, but one day that destiny will be realized. So each thing has to transform itself into something better, and to acquire a new destiny, until, someday, the soul of the world becomes one thing only. The sun thought about that, and decided to shine more brightly. The wind, which was enjoying the conversation, started to blow with greater force, so that the sun would not blind the boy. This is why alchemy exists, the boy said. So that everyone will search for his treasure, find it, and then want to be better than he was in his former life. Lead will play its role until the world has no further need for lead, and then lead will have to turn itself into gold. That's what alchemists do. They show that, when we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better too. Well, why did you say that I don't know about love? The son asked the boy. Because it's not love to be static like the desert, nor is it love to roam the world like the wind. And it's not love to see everything from a distance, like you do. Love is the force that transforms and improves the soul of the world. When I first reached through to it, I thought the soul of the world was perfect. But later, I could see that it was like other aspects of creation, and had its own passions and wars. It is we who nourish the soul of the world, and the world we live in will be either better or worse, depending on whether we become better or worse. And that's where the power of love comes in. Because when we love, we always strive to become better than we are. So what do you want of me? The son asked. I want you to help me turn myself into the wind, the boy answered. Nature knows me as the wisest being in creation, the son said. But I don't know how to turn you into the wind. Then, whom should I ask? The son thought for a minute. The wind was listening closely and wanted to tell every corner of the world that the son's wisdom had its limitations. That it was unable to deal with this boy who spoke the language of the world. Speak to the hand that wrote all, said the son. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 85-94 The wind screamed with delight and blew harder than ever. The tents were being blown from their ties to the earth, and the animals were being freed from their tethers. On the cliff, the men clutched at each other as they sought to keep from being blown away. The boy turned to the hand that wrote all. As he did so, he sensed that the universe had fallen silent, and he decided not to speak. A current of love rushed from his heart, and the boy began to pray. It was a prayer that he had never said before, because it was a prayer without words or pleas. His prayer didn't give thanks for his sheep having found new pastures, it didn't ask that the boy be able to sell more crystal, and it didn't beseech that the woman he had met continue to await his return. In the silence, the boy understood that the desert, the wind, and the sun were also trying to understand the signs written by the hand, and were seeking to follow their paths, and to understand what had been written on a single emerald. He saw that omens were scattered throughout the earth and in space, and that there was no reason or significance attached to their appearance, he could see that not the deserts, nor the winds, nor the sun, nor people knew why they had been created. But that the hand had a reason for all of this, and that only the hand could perform miracles, or transform the sea into a desert, or a man into the wind. Because only the hand understood that it was a larger design that had moved the universe to the point at which six days of creation had evolved into a master work. The boy reached through to the soul of the world and saw that it was a part of the soul of God. And he saw that the soul of God was his own soul. And that he, a boy, could perform miracles. Asterisk. The simum blew that day as it had never blown before. For generations thereafter, the Arabs recounted the legend of a boy who had turned himself into the wind, almost destroying a military camp, in defiance of the most powerful chief in the desert. When the simum ceased to blow, everyone looked to the place where the boy had been. But he was no longer there, he was standing next to a sand-covered sentinel, on the far side of the camp. The men were terrified at his sorcery. But there were two people who were smiling, the alchemist, because he had found his perfect disciple, and the chief, because that disciple had understood the glory of God. The following day, the general bade the boy and the alchemist farewell, and provided them with an escort party to accompany them as far as they chose. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 86-94 Asterisk They rode for the entire day. Toward the end of the afternoon, they came upon a Coptic monastery. 
the alchemist dismounted and told the escorts they could return to the camp. From here on, you will be alone, the alchemist said. You are only three hours from the pyramids. Thank you, said the boy. You taught me the language of the world. I only invoked what you already knew. The alchemist knocked on the gate of the monastery. A monk dressed in black came to the gates. They spoke for a few minutes in the Coptic tongue, and the alchemist bade the boy enter. I asked him to let me use the kitchen for a while, the alchemist smiled. They went to the kitchen at the back of the monastery. The alchemist lighted the fire, and the monk brought him some lead, which the alchemist placed in an iron pan. When the lead had become liquid, the alchemist took from his pouch the strange yellow egg. He scraped from it a sliver as thin as a hair, wrapped it in wax, and added it to the pan in which the lead had melted. The mixture took on a reddish color, almost the color of blood. The alchemist removed the pan from the fire and set it aside to cool. As he did so, he talked with the monk about the tribal wars. I think they're going to last for a long time, he said to the monk. The monk was irritated. The caravans had been stopped at Giza for some time, waiting for the wars to end. But gods will be done, the monk said. Exactly, answered the alchemist. When the pan had cooled, the monk and the boy looked at it, dazzled. The lead had dried into the shape of the pan, but it was no longer lead. It was gold. Will I learn to do that someday, the boy asked. This was my destiny, not yours, the alchemist answered. But I wanted to show you that it was possible. They returned to the gates of the monastery. There, the alchemist separated the disc into four parts. Paulo Coelho, the alchemist, page 87-94. This is for you, he said, holding one of the parts out to the monk. It's for your generosity to the pilgrims. But this payment goes well beyond my generosity, the monk responded. Don't say that again. Life might be listening, and give you less the next time. The alchemist turned to the boy. This is for you. To make up for what you gave to the general. The boy was about to say that it was much more than he had given the general. But he kept quiet, because he had heard what the alchemist said to the monk. And this is for me, said the alchemist, keeping one of the parts. Because I have to return to the desert, where there are tribal wars. He took the fourth part and handed it to the monk. This is for the boy. If he ever needs it. But I'm going in search of my treasure, the boy said. I'm very close to it now. And I'm certain you'll find it, the alchemist said. Then why this? Because you have already lost your savings twice. Once to the thief, and... Once to the general. I'm an old, superstitious Arab, and I believe in our proverbs. There's one that says, everything that happens once can never happen again. But everything that happens twice will surely happen a third time. They mounted their horses. Asterisk I want to tell you a story about dreams, said the alchemist. The boy brought his horse closer. In ancient Rome, at the time of Emperor Tiberius, there lived a good man who had two sons. One was in the military, and had been sent to the most distant regions of the empire. The other son was a poet, and delighted all of Rome with his beautiful verses. One night, the father had a dream. An angel appeared to him, and told him that the words of one of his sons would be learned and repeated throughout. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 88-94 The World for All Generations to Come The father woke from his dream grateful and crying, because life was generous, and had revealed to him something any father would be proud to know. Shortly thereafter, the father died as he tried to save a child who was about to be crushed by the wheels of a chariot. Since he had lived his entire life in a manner that was correct and fair, he went directly to heaven, where he met the angel that had appeared in his dream. You were always a good man, the angel said to him. You lived your life in a loving way, and died with dignity. I can now grant you any wish you desire. Life was good to me, the man said. When you appeared in my dream, I felt that all my efforts had been rewarded, because my son's poems will be read by men for generations to come. I don't want anything for myself. But any father would be proud of the fame achieved by one whom he had cared for as a child and educated as he grew up. Sometime in the distant future, I would like to see my son's words. The angel touched the man's shoulder, and they were both projected far into the future. They were in an immense setting, surrounded by thousands of people speaking a strange language. The man wept with happiness. I knew that my son's poems were immortal, he said to the angel through his tears. Can you please tell me which of my son's poems these people are repeating? 
The angel came closer to the man, and, with tenderness, led him to a bench nearby, where they sat down. The verses of your son who was the poet were very popular in Rome, the angel said. Everyone loved them and enjoyed them. But when the reign of Tiberius ended, his poems were forgotten. The words you're hearing now are those of your son in the military. The man looked at the angel in surprise. Your son went to serve at a distant place and became a centurion. He was just and good. One afternoon, one of his servants fell ill, and it appeared that he would die. Your son had heard of a rabbi who was able to cure illnesses, and he rode out for days and days in search of this man. Along the way, he learned that the man he was seeking was the Son of God. He met others who had been cured by him, and they instructed your son in the man's teachings. And so, despite the fact that he was a Roman. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 89-94 Centurion, he converted to their faith. Shortly thereafter, he reached the place where the man he was looking for was visiting. He told the man that one of his servants was gravely ill, and the rabbi made ready to go to his house with him. But the centurion was a man of faith, and, looking into the eyes of the rabbi, he knew that he was surely in the presence of the Son of God. And this is what your son said, the angel told the man. These are the words he said to the rabbi at that point, and they have never been forgotten, My lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. The alchemist said, No matter what he does, every person on earth plays a central role in the history of the world. And normally he doesn't know it. The boy smiled. He had never imagined that questions about life would be of such importance to a shepherd. Goodbye, the alchemist said. Goodbye, said the boy. Asterisk. The boy rode along through the desert for several hours, listening avidly to what his heart had to say. It was his heart that would tell him where his treasure was hidden. Where your treasure is, there also will be your heart, the alchemist had told him. But his heart was speaking of other things. With pride, it told the story of a shepherd who had left his flock to follow a dream he had on two different occasions. It told of destiny, and of the many men who had wandered in search of distant lands, or beautiful women, confronting the people of their times with their preconceived notions. It spoke of journeys, discoveries, books, and change. As he was about to climb yet another dune, his heart whispered, Be aware of the place where you are brought to tears. That's where I am, and that's where your treasure is. The boy climbed the dune slowly. A full moon rose again in the starry sky. It had been a month since he had set forth from the oasis. The moonlight cast shadows through the dunes, creating the appearance of a rolling sea. It reminded the boy of the day, when that horse had reared in the desert, and he had come to know the alchemist. And the moon fell on the deserts. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 90-94 Silence, and on a man's journey in search of treasure. When he reached the top of the dune, his heart leapt. There, illuminated by the light of the moon and the brightness of the desert, stood the solemn and majestic pyramids of Egypt. The boy fell to his knees and wept. He thanked God for making him believe in his destiny and for leading him to meet a king, a merchant, an Englishman, and an alchemist. And above all for his having met a woman of the desert who had told him that love would never keep a man from his destiny. If he wanted to, he could now return to the oasis, go back to Fatima, and live his life as a simple shepherd. After all, the alchemist continued to live in the desert, even though he understood the language of the world and knew how to transform lead into gold. He didn't need to demonstrate his science and art to anyone. The boy told himself that, on the way toward realizing his own destiny, he had learned all he needed to know and had experienced everything he might have dreamed of. But here he was, at the point of finding his treasure, and he reminded himself that no project is completed until its objective has been achieved. The boy looked at the sands around him, and saw that, where his tears had fallen, a scarab beetle was scuttling through the sand. During his time in the desert, he had learned that, in Egypt, the scarab beetles are a symbol of God. Another omen. The boy began to dig into the dune. As he did so, he thought of what the crystal merchant had once said, that anyone could build a pyramid in his backyard. The boy could see now that he couldn't do so if he placed stone upon stone for the rest of his life. Throughout the night, the boy dug at the place he had chosen, but found nothing. He felt weighted down by the centuries of time since the pyramids had been built. But he didn't stop. He struggled to continue digging as he fought the wind, which often blew the sand back into the excavation. His hands were abraded and exhausted, but he listened to his heart. It had told him to dig where his tears fell. 
As he was attempting to pull out the rocks he encountered, he heard footsteps. Several figures approached him. Their backs were to the moonlight, and the boy could see neither their eyes nor their faces. What are you doing here? One of the figures demanded. Because he was terrified, the boy didn't answer. He had found where his treasure was, and was frightened at what might happen. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 91-94 We're refugees from the tribal wars, and we need money, the other figure said. What are you hiding there? I'm not hiding anything, the boy answered. But one of them seized the boy and yanked him back out of the hole. Another, who was searching the boy's bags, found the piece of gold. There's gold here, he said. The moon shone on the face of the Arab who had seized him, and in the man's eyes the boy saw death. He's probably got more gold hidden in the ground. They made the boy continue digging, but he found nothing. As the sun rose, the men began to beat the boy. He was bruised and bleeding, his clothing was torn to shreds, and he felt that death was near. What good is money to you if you're going to die? It's not often that money can save someone's life, the alchemist had said. Finally, the boy screamed at the men, I'm digging for treasure. And, although his mouth was bleeding and swollen, he told his attackers that he had twice dreamed of a treasure hidden near the pyramids of Egypt. The man who appeared to be the leader of the group spoke to one of the others, leave him. He doesn't have anything else. He must have stolen this gold. The boy fell to the sand, nearly unconscious. The leader shook him and said, we're leaving. But before they left, he came back to the boy and said, you're not going to die. You'll live, and you'll learn that a man shouldn't be so stupid. Two years ago, right here on this spot, I had a recurrent dream too. I dreamed that I should travel to the fields of Spain, and look for a ruined church where shepherds and their sheep slept. In my dream, there was a sycamore growing out of the ruins of the sacristy, and I was told that, if I dug at the roots of the sycamore, I would find a hidden treasure. But I'm not so stupid as to cross an entire desert just because of a recurrent dream. And they disappeared. The boy stood up shakily, and looked once more at the pyramids. They seemed to laugh at him, and he laughed back, his heart bursting with joy. Because now he knew where his treasure was. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 92-94 Epilogue The boy reached the small, abandoned church just as night was falling. The sycamore was still there in the sacristy, and the stars could still be seen through the half-destroyed roof. He remembered the time he had been there with his sheep. It had been a peaceful night, except for the dream. Now he was here not with his flock, but with a shovel. He sat looking at the sky for a long time. Then he took from his knapsack a bottle of wine, and drank some. He remembered the night in the desert, when he had sat with the alchemist, as they looked at the stars and drank wine together. He thought of the many roads he had traveled, and of the strange way God had chosen to show him his treasure. If he hadn't believed in the significance of recurrent dreams, he would not have met the gypsy woman, the king, the thief, or... Well, it's a long list. But the path was written in the omens, and there was no way I could go wrong, he said to himself. He fell asleep, and when he awoke the sun was already high. He began to dig at the base of the sycamore. You old sorcerer, the boy shouted up to the sky. You knew the whole story. You even left a bit of gold at the monastery, so I could get back to this church. The monk laughed when he saw me come back in tatters. Couldn't you have saved me from that? No, he heard a voice on the wind say. If I had told you, you wouldn't have seen the pyramids. They're beautiful, aren't they? The boy smiled and continued digging. Half an hour later, his shovel hit something solid. An hour later, he had before him a chest of Spanish gold coins. There were also precious stones, gold masks adorned with red and white feathers, and stone statues embedded with jewels. The spoils of a conquest that the country had long ago forgotten, and that some conquistador had failed to tell his children about. The boy took out Urim and Thummim from his bag. He had used the two stones only once, one morning when he was at a marketplace. His life and his path had always provided him with enough omens. He placed Urim and Thummim in the chest. They were also a part of his new treasure, because they were a reminder of the old king, whom he would. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 93-94 Never see again. It's true, life really is generous to those who pursue their destiny, the boy thought. Then he remembered that he had to get to Tarifa, so he could give one-tenth of his treasure to the gypsy woman, as he had promised. Those gypsies are really smart, he thought. 
Maybe it was because they moved around so much. The wind began to blow again. It was the Levanter, the wind that came from Africa. It didn't bring with it the smell of the desert, nor the threat of Moorish invasion. Instead, it brought the scent of a perfume he knew well, and the touch of a kiss, a kiss that came from far away, slowly, slowly, until it rested on his lips. The boy smiled. It was the first time she had done that. I'm coming, Fatima, he said. Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, page 94-94.